there are two dangers in the way we approach or we think about Satan. If the common danger in our culture is not to believe Satan exists, then there is a danger on the other side, which is we become obsessed with Satan and we terrify people with Satan's power without the complementary truth that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, that the power of the Holy Spirit is far greater than the power of Satan. Welcome to the Crossway Podcast, a show where we sit down with authors each week for thoughtful interviews about the Bible, theology, church history, and the Christian life. I'm Matt Tully, and today I'm talking with Ian Duguid. Ian serves as professor of Old Testament and dean of online learning at Westminster Theological Seminary and the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church in Glenside, Pennsylvania. He served as a missionary in Liberia and planted churches in Pennsylvania, California, and England. He's also the author of The Whole Armor of God, How Christ's Victory Strengthens Us for Spiritual Warfare with Crossway. Today, Ian and I discuss Satan and demons. He explains what the Bible really teaches us about the devil, how to avoid overestimating or underestimating his impact on the world and even on our day-to-day lives, and why our culture seems fascinated by demons when it comes to horror movies and Halloween. Let's get started. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining us on the Crossway Podcast today. I'm very happy to be with you. So when it comes to spiritual warfare and thinking about evil powers in our world, it strikes me that a lot of times in our culture today, and even among Christians, the dominant realms where we actually think about those kinds of things are relegated to Halloween and horror movies. You know, we see uh, there's a lot of horror movies of late that seem like they're focused on the occult and and not on aliens necessarily, but on, you know, uh, more realistic sort of evil forces in our world. Why do you think it is that so much of our thinking and conversation about those things is relegated to those two cultural spheres? I think Satan essentially has two distinct strategies he uses in different places at different times. Uh, the first strategy, the one he's using in our culture, Uh, is to uh, uh, persuade us that he's not real. Uh, Mm. Who could possibly believe in the kind of demons and devil that is depicted in the Halloween stories and uh, slasher movies? Uh, And because people don't believe he's real, that, of course, suits his purposes. He can do his work undetected, unsuspected. Um, At other times and places, he goes to the opposite end and uh, magnifies his power, goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom whom he may devour, terrifying people into submission. Uh, And uh, I think he picks whichever strategy is most suitable for the cultural moments uh, in which he's operating. He's very smart. uh, And he knows that in our culture, the most effective way to do his work is to persuade people that there is no such thing as the devil. Uh, And therefore, we don't need to be armed. If we're not uh, afraid of any conflict, if we're not expecting conflict, uh, then we go through life uh, not uh, not anticipating, therefore not prepared for the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. Why do you think it is that in our context, in, you know, we're speaking in the United States and in the Western world more generally, why is it his strategy to sort of downplay his own existence rather than magnify it? Because I think uh, in some ways it's, it's his most effective strategy because people don't believe he exists and therefore uh, they uh, do not expect him to do anything. They don't look for him. They don't anticipate him. Uh, they don't prepare for him. We also live at a time with, that uh, is, is spiritual uh, but not religious. And so people are interested in spiritual aspects, but typically, particularly in the good spiritual aspects. And so lots of people believe in angels and they'll have their bumper stickers saying, angels are watching over me. Hmm. I haven't seen many uh, bumper stickers that said, watch out for demons. They might be <laughs> watching over you too. Uh, and, and the result is, yeah, that we're unprepared for the warfare. So in light of that dynamic, though, that we are, as you say, sort of unprepared, not really thinking this is a real danger and threat to us, what do you think explains the, at the same time, the uh, attraction that we have to scary things like that, to uh, some of the, the craziness of Halloween at times and horror movies and haunted houses? It feels like that industry is uh, very strong right now. There's really no uh, reluctance to participate in those kinds of things. What, what explains that in your mind? 
I think the answer is we, we like to be safely scared. Uh, nobody actually wants to be uh, on the Normandy beachfront on D-Day, surrounded by real live bullets. But if you were to create an adventure theme park where you could simulate it and you could guarantee that nobody would get hurt in the midst of the action, you would have a, a, a bestseller on your hands. Mm. Uh, we like, uh, yeah, we like to simulate experiences that feel scary, but we know really they're not scary. There's no actual uh, substance to them. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that enables us then to feel safe in the midst of a world that actually is really scary, uh, much mm. scarier than we really want to acknowledge. Yeah, you write in the book, uh, this is a quote from the book, in many respects, the dark world in which we live is Satan's playground. And um, to be honest, hearing hearing you say that, it it feels kind of extreme. It, it's uncomfortable to think about uh, the world in that way. And so how do you... How do you balance the two poles of, on the one hand, downplaying the significance of Satan's presence and activity in the role in the world, and um, on the other hand, sort of attributing any kind of difficult situation or painful circumstance or disaster to him directly? Right. So anybody who has trouble turning in their their uh, course papers on time has uh, the demon <laughs> demon of laziness. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think. There's a, there's a fine balance there, and and I think this this the, the military imagery that Paul is focusing on in Ephesians six helps us with that, because if you think about how you prepare soldiers for battle, uh, you don't want them to be paralyzed with fear, uh, but you do want them to have a proper sense of just how dangerous the the uh, the place that they're operating is. Uh, mm. And uh, so too with the Christian life, we don't want to terrify people and make people feel like uh, I'm I'm in a world that is dominated by our enemy, uh, and that God is sort of step back and uh, is watching from a distance, and and it's me and uh, Satan face to face. But at the same time, we don't want people to neglect the reality of the warfare. Uh, Satan is very smart. He's been tempting people for a long time. He's much uh, better equipped. He's adapted his temptations to the kind of world in which we live in uh, and our fallen flesh. So we have these three very powerful enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, operating in tandem uh, together. Uh, so we should be rightly uh, afraid of that in, with the kind of fear that makes us do the right things. And that's why soldiers, of course, train under live fire so that when they actually get into the battle situation, uh, they've, uh, they know how to control their fear uh, because they've trained for this. They, they know what uh, their equipment, they know what they're supposed to do. Uh, and so that's what keeps them safe in the midst of the firefight. Yeah, you mentioned temptation is one of the, the main ways that Satan attacks Christians uh, and, and people more broadly. What are some of the other ways that Satan and uh, demons uh, actually interact with people on a normal basis? Well, temptation is one of the, the most uh, significant ones because, of course, that's his go Satan's goal is to get us to sin, uh, to get us to live as if there were no God, uh, as if we were our own gods, uh, making our own set of rules. And everything that revolves around that uh, is in the realm of, of temptation. Um, as Christians, we don't need to fear being possessed uh, by the devil. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit who lives within us is more powerful than he is. Uh, but uh, we should uh, rightly uh, fear temptation. Uh, we are to pray, lead us not into temptation. And the reason we pray that is because we know that we don't have the strength in ourselves to stand against temptation. That strength can only be given to us by God. Hmm. So often when we think about the gospel, it is focused primarily on uh, our atonement before God, our, our, the, the fixing of our relationship with God. And it does feel like the, the, the gospel connection to spiritual warfare against Satan and, and his minions is sort of an afterthought or it's sort of um, not really discussed as much. Well, I think it's easy for us to think of the gospel in truncated terms simply as a, the means of our justification. Uh, and when it comes to spiritual warfare, I would, again, I think perhaps in our circles, we've, like our culture, tended to downplay 
uh, the reality of spiritual warfare. Um, you know, when you think of spiritual warfare, you often immediately think of, of more charismatic believers uh, who perhaps are tempted in the opposite direction. Uh, I think in our circles, we often uh, think that, uh, yeah, we can, we can take on the devil by means of our fine Bible study and uh, close analysis of scriptural passages, um, yeah, which is certainly important. Uh, but we uh, miss the, the wider uh, aspects of that spiritual warfare. Uh, and of course, the centrality of prayer uh, is, is through, uh, throughout Ephesians 6. Uh, it's not really a separate piece of the armor. It's the foundation uh, and uh, the means by which all of the pieces of, of armor operate in the Christian life. So one of the, the dominant touch points that many evangelicals have when it comes to thinking about spiritual warfare and thinking about Satan and his schemes and how they interact with us would have to be C.S. Lewis's famous book, The Screwtape Letters, mm-hmm. where he, he just gives us this um, pretty compelling, eye-opening account that really, I think, conforms to uh, the 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 approach that Satan takes uh, in the U.S. primarily, that of sort of downplaying his own presence and existence and his own work and uh, tempting us to do things that we maybe already feel predisposed to do. As you think about the screw tape letters, what do you appreciate about what Lewis was doing there? And are there things that you feel like he kind of gets wrong and maybe leads us to think wrongly about spiritual warfare? Yeah, it's been a while since I read the screw tape letters, but uh, I, I think he captures... Uh, quite profoundly, the the uh, the ethos of the tempters, uh, the way in which they're um, almost bureaucrats. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, they're chalking up their their, their victories, and and the the way in which the younger tempter is constantly striving to progress himself and. Uh, and the means in which he does that is by successfully deceiving uh, his subject into not believing his, in his existence. Uh, there's one point where he talks about, uh, where the older tempter talks about the danger of big temptations. Because when somebody falls in a big way, then that, that's a sufficient shock to the system that they may actually, it may actually stop them in their tracks and turn them around. Whereas mm. people who can be tempted in very, very small ways uh, to betray their faith just persistently uh, in sins that are almost not worth mentioning uh, become, uh, from his perspective, a much safer way of keeping sinners in their sins, um, Mm. which I think is exactly right. Um, Mm. and, uh, and, And should be a challenge to us in the church because often uh, we in the church we can respond very badly to big sinners. Um, church can be a hard place for big sinners to come to. Um, we don't always have a have to welcome that out for people whose sins are dramatic. Um, whereas small sinners can be very comfortable in our midst, um, so long as they they keep their sins within manageable limits, nobody will challenge them. So as you think about pastors who are. Uh, seeking to be faithful to what Scripture says about uh, spiritual warfare on the one hand and what it is for us to to take on the whole armor of God and to prepare ourselves and, and to be steadfast in resisting the schemes of the devil. What are some of the pitfalls that you think church leaders can fall into when they teach about these things? There are two dangers in the way we approach or we think about Satan. Uh, if the common danger in our culture is not to believe Satan exists, then there is a danger on the other side, which is we become obsessed with Satan. Uh, and we terrify people with Satan's power without the complementary truth that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, uh, that the power of the Holy Spirit is far greater than the power of Satan, that Satan cannot tempt us beyond what the permission God gives him to. And God is able to enable us to, to stand in temptation. Uh, and sometimes God will not enable us to stand in temptation, which also will be for our sanctification. Um, I mean, we often think about sanctification simply in terms of becoming better people. Um, but if the things that God values 
are humility and dependence. H- how do you create humility and dependence? You have to, you have to let people mm. fall. Um, and, uh, and, and clearly that is God's strategy. You know, it clearly does not hold us up every minute as Christians and prevent us from falling. He could. Uh, I'd vote for that. Uh, but mm-hmm. somehow for God's glory and for our good, he's determined that it's better for us sometimes that he steps back and allows us to sin. And, and when you think about your own experience of sin, I think it's not hard to see why. You know, the weeks when we have a pretty good week and we feel like we've done pretty well, we come to church and we, we don't really feel like we need the gospel that much. But when we've had a terrible week and we've we've sinned against our families and against our co-workers and against ourselves and against God, uh, and then we come to church and we're reminded of the gospel. Those are the days when the gospel really shines and when the free grace of God is magnified uh, and we value it all the more. So I'd imagine that could be a, a pretty hard thing to grasp, though, for a lot of people. It, it could seem to sort of make God out to be, it, he could help us, he could uh, do good by us, but he chooses not to for some reason. Uh, how, do you, how do you think about that and um, I guess not fall into sort of viewing God as being in some way responsible for our sin. Right. Well, you start out with the fundamental truths, which is that God is sovereign. He can do all his holy will, everything he wishes to do. And ultimately, we are going to be holy. Uh, well, he's not going to leave any of us half done. Uh, he has begun a good work and you will bring it to completion on the, on the day of Christ Jesus, not before. Uh, And God does everything for his own glory and for our good. And since as we look at the world around us, it's self-evident that he does not instantly sanctify us when we become Christians, there must be some way in which our sin even works for for his glory and for our good. Hmm. Um, And uh, that's why he leaves human sin in general, and that's why he leaves our sin in particular, because he's going to do something through that that will bring him glory and be good for us. Uh, and once you start to ask, okay, so what could possibly be good for us in our sin, uh, then you start to see it. Yeah, it humbles us. It shows us our need of the gospel. Uh, it magnifies God's grace that he's saved really big sinners. Uh, and uh, it also, I mean, as the Westman's Confession reminds us, uh, when God turns us over to our sin, that causes us to be more watchful in future, uh, to be more uh, dependent upon him, to pray uh, more fervently. Um, you know, got good parents understand this. Um, you know, my wife in, in her book talks about, uh, a time when our daughter Hannah was just learning to, to walk. Uh, and, uh, she noticed her older brothers coming downstairs, you know, walking straight downstairs and she thought she should be able to do likewise. And we tried to persuade her that she was not yet ready to walk down the stairs and that she should you know, kind of sit sit on her bottom and kind of bump herself down. Well, she was having none of that. Uh, <laughs> and and we, we constantly, we'd turn around and, and she'd be halfway up the stairs and we have to go rescue her. And so the only way to deal with this as wise parents was to look for an opportunity to let her fall. And so there was one day when we, you know, we, we picked the spot, you know, the carpeted mm. stairs so she wouldn't seriously hurt herself. But where we saw her, two steps up, turn around, ready to come down, where we didn't go and rescue her. And sure enough, she fell flat on her face and there were lots of tears, but she learned the lesson. Mm. And that was good for her. Uh, And so as good parents, sometimes, you know, you have to let your children fail because there are things they're going to learn through that, that if you go in and bail them out all the time, uh, they're not going to learn that. And so too, Mm. God is a good father. He, uh, He will not allow us to sin in ways that will destroy us, but he will allow us to sin in ways that can be very hurtful to us, but will ultimately work for our good and for his glory as we grow in our understanding of the gospel. Yeah, that's such an encouraging truth for us to cling to and you know, even extending that to trusting that God is sovereign and has good intentions for uh, his allowance of Satan and mm. demons to continue to exist in this world and continue to you know, uh, exercise a lot of scary power over over things that we, we kind of wish they wouldn't. Uh, what encouragement would you offer to the person who sometimes does feel afraid, uh, does feel uh, scared at, at what 
uh, is out there and they feel like, I don't know how to navigate this. Yeah. Yeah. Satan is a roaring lion, but he's a lion on a leash. He, he can only go so far and no further. Um, yeah, in Pilgrim's Progress, there's that scene where Pilgrim is passing between uh, these ravening animals. And, and first he's terrified until he realizes that they're chained. And so long as he stays on the path through, down the middle, that they can't touch him. Um, and uh, it's, it's the same way with, with Satan. He has no power beyond what our good father gives to him. Uh, and that's really the focus of Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is a great place to turn for people who are fearful about uh, all manner of dangers. We live in a dangerous world, uh, and uh, Satan is, is one of those dangers. Uh, but we live in a, in a dangerous world in which we have a refuge, a refuge that will protect us against those things in Christ. Uh, and uh, uh, if we're in Christ, then Satan has no power to harm us. Uh, he can tempt us. Uh, he can lead us astray as God gives him permission to. But at the end, God is going to work all that for good. Uh, and part of God's triumph will be to snatch people uh, out of Satan's hands. You know, people who you would feel they, they if anybody, should end up in hell. And yet God's grace is big enough to reach down to people like that and rescue them because it's big enough for us. So what advice would you offer to parents who, who want to faithfully teach their kids, maybe their young kids, what scripture says about spiritual warfare, how to start uh, equipping themselves with the armor of God, but also want to be sensitive to their age and what's appropriate to share about these things and, and how not to scare them unnecessarily. Yeah, kind of what, maybe what did you do as a parent and uh, what, what encouragement would you give to parents today? Yeah, well, lots of kids lo love battle imagery and battle stories. So that's an, an obvious place to start. Um, and, and also as parents, we, we do need to teach them about dangers in the world in which we live. Um, the danger of strangers, for example. And again, we want to steer a, a solid line between, on the one hand, making them so terrified they can't ever talk to anybody they don't know, or on the other hand, being so trusting that they're open to, uh, to, to danger. It's the same thing in terms of spiritual warfare. We want to uh, encourage them to see the reality of the enemy we have in Satan, uh, that uh, temptations don't simply come from ourselves, so we're certainly able to manufacture all kinds of sins on, on our own. Uh, we have an enemy who takes and exacerbates that. And we should talk about that with our children. But we should also talk about the fact that we have a greater God who by his spirit is in us, uh, who protects us and helps us to fight the battle against the, the evil one. Pilgrim's Progress, of course, is a great place to go for that. Um, it's a book uh, written for all ages, not just children, uh, but uh, it, it captures the imagination of children uh, and shows them the very real dangers of uh, the evil one. Uh, but of course, the story has a happy ending. Christian and ultimately his family make their way to the, the holy city, to the new Jerusalem, where there is no, no longer any fear of the evil one. Uh, no more temptation, no more tears, no more sin, no more suffering, no more sickness, but only the everlasting embrace of God. Well, Ian, thank you so much for taking some time today to speak with us on the Crossway Podcast and, and really walk us through this crucial passage of Scripture and help us better understand uh, what it is Paul's telling us and better understand really the hope that we have in and through the gospel because of Christ, and because of what God has done for us. It's been my pleasure. That was Ian Duguid on Satan and Demons. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, The Whole Armor of God, How Christ's Victory Strengthens Us for Spiritual Warfare, available online or at your local Christian bookstore. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review which helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.